Okay, so there are a lot of limitations to the stuff that we've been talking about and the predictions for using the KOW or the S. Uh, what are some of the limitations? Well, not all soil organics have the same ability to absorb organic solutes. So the distribution of the organics on top of the soil, is it like absorbed into it? Is it coated? Is, where is it located? And the types of organics on the soil. Uh, can vary. Is it the old versus the young stuff? Is it, you know, how is the organic something? So we can just kind of estimate it, but it may not be the completely into there. Absorption to mineral fraction may be actually be significant, especially for some very weakly polar organic compounds or if there's a lot of clay in the system. These type of systems will actually have a lot of absorption into there, so we can't just base everything on the organic compound. Um, the solute effects uh, could be important. So, you know, we, we say we did these things under isothermic reactions. So we did these batch experiments. We had the temperature always the same. What happens if there's variation in temperature? We can actually change some of the solubilities and some of the systems. Cold solvent. We really haven't talked about, like, if we mix things together. Well, what happens to that? Well, we might be able to dissolve something. Uh, so if we have a mix of different organic compounds, which is actually more uh, more common than just having a single contaminant, we can have some co-solvent effects that are taken care of into this. And then the pH of the system. We talked about the uh, zero net charge point of, of the system. Well, especially if you've got some sort of ionic compounds onto your organic, um, when we talked about the way the organics look like, the pH might actually affect those. So we might actually see an effect of pH. Um, you know, if we look at the KOWs and S's, there's a range of values, and so they're, how, how accurate are those? And then we, when we did this KOC measurement, when they came up with that equation, they were using a silica powder, and so sometimes when these things don't work really well under very low conditions. So we have to take it to a grain of salt, but if you don't know anything about a system, this is a great place to start and a great place to work off of in order to be able to do some of your systems in there. I just wanted to go over one example um, that I have here looking at, um, like, so one of the things that we've been talking about is just transport. We haven't talked about biodegradation. I remember in the microbial communities before, and I talked about how microorganisms could eat them. So how do we know if they are based upon some of these retardation factors and some of these systems, and what does the real data look like? So say we had a mixture of a different kind of cup. So we had carbon tetrachloride. Um, we had PCE, which you guys should know and stuff like that. And then we have our chloride tracer here. We've got time and days on this axis, and then this is the relative concentration with zero to one. So this is our breakthrough curves in here, and our T is our center of mass, okay? And so we can take it here, so the chloride concentration, the center of mass comes through here, and there's very little dispersion that's occurring here. The salt came up, and the salt comes right back down, and then we're comparing it to the carbon tet and the, the PCE. So you can see how the times have switched PC being uh, more having greater retardation than the carbon tet versus the chloride because it takes longer and then there's a lot more dispersion in here. So for overall for the site, the average groundwater velocity equals, you know, over here is 0 0.8 meters per day at five meters away. So this is this is where all the sampling was taken in here. The velocity it took, you know, five meters, it took 70 days, so it's 0 0.7 meters per day. So that's the average groundwater velocity. So if we take that, and remember we talked about how to figure out our retardation, we take the time of the retarded solute over the unretarded. For carbon tet, we get 1.8, and for PCE, we get 3.3. And then if we took the areas under the curves of each one of these, uh, notice, um, uh, so if we look at the area underneath each one of these, the areas are approximately systems. So there is no significant degradation at 5 meters. These are under uh, oxic conditions. And if you guys remember when we talked about this, stop doing that, shifting the light there. Um, uh, we talked about these compounds. They really only degrade under anaerobic conditions. So under aerobic or, or oxic conditions, these things just flow through the system. And we have nonlinear absorption change. This is what's going on down here. And so the system, if we look under the area of each of these curves, it's just basically migrating into there. We just have retardation, so it takes longer into there. These things are more spread out, um, uh, all the stuff that we've talked about. Now, let's look at another system where, say, degradation is actually occurring. What would that system look like? I'm going to change my little paper here. 
So say we have the same thing. Here's the time and days. Here's our relative concentration, which we're talking about. Here's our chloride. Uh, in here, here is other compounds, and so this is dichlorobromide, uh, I mean benzene, and then uh, this one is hexachloroethene in, inside of here. And so we can't even detect it, and so we can barely detect this. So if we look at the, the time for the chloride, and we can barely even see these, we know that this compound here, the uh, uh, dichlorobenzene, has a retardation of 3.7, and we can't even figure it out for this compound here because there is really no breakthrough curve in here because it's all been degraded. So we can't even see them. And so it takes longer for it together. We can't even detect it. And so the area of the under, and even this compound, when we compare the area under the curve for chloride versus our other compounds, we only get about 22% of that. And so 78% of this has all been degraded over five years, and almost all of it has been degraded under this. And so this is part of the thing is, is that when we look at these breakthrough curves, we cannot just tell if it's being retarded. We can also look at if it's being biodegraded in the system too and get some information about the system. When I look at that first uh, example where I said there was uh, no biodegradation and stuff like that. We can look at, see this is the chloride concentrations at day 1, day 85, 492, 647, and the center of mass is moving this way. And then if we look at the same day roughly, and we look at where these compounds are, our PCE hasn't really moved very far, our chloride's moved very far, our carbon tetrachloride is moved right in there. And so we can also look at the center of mass of where these things are relative to the chloride in order to be able to figure out our retardation factors. One of the things just about absorption is that absorption and those retardation factors, are they, are they always the same? So like if we come up with a retardation factor for a compound, is it always that same number throughout the entire system? No, it can change. Um, it can change because of either changing soil types that are in there, changing velocities, changing the environmental conditions, as we've talked about, the amount of organic compounds, uh, the microbial, the temperature, all these different things. And so when we do these batch experiments or we do these column experiments, we only look at one like point in time. And so then we look at real life situations, we're going to see variations inside of there. And, you know, we, we, we've had values where it really varies with time. So, you know, absorption causes um, retardation of many of different types of organic compounds, and it really does vary from the contaminant, the site, and even within the site, because you can get heterogeneities. And the estimations of absorption from the uh, all these different things that I was talking about, like the KOCs and anything like that, could be really low. And so, especially in an aquifer system, we don't usually have a lot of organic system, um, organic carbons in there. Usually, that's in our upper soil system. Um, can be really thing. And when we try to estimate this, and we try to do these batch experiments, they don't always work. And so, if we really want to do this, we should be looking at field experiments. Uh, labs are great for getting SKD, but we really should be doing field experiments to get R.